Hello everybody, Shrouded Hand here. I thought I'd try something a little bit different in this video. It's a straight up narration. I'm going to be reading an article published in The Lancet on January the 12th, 1856, and it's titled On Filamentous Entozoan Worms in the Living Human Body by Jonathan Green, MD. In the months of May and June 1843, we published in The Lancet two papers of mine, Entozoan Worms Inhabiting the Living Body. These papers, I believe, occasioned doubt in the minds of some professional gentlemen, amounting more or less to a want of credence in the facts stated therein. This I in some degree anticipated, as such cases are extremely rare in this country, so much so that most practitioners pass through professional life without ever having seen a case of entozoan worms inhabiting the tissues of the human body and it is the only case of that kind that I ever saw. I will here briefly recapitulate the essentials of the rare case, entozoan worms inhabiting the living body, as detailed in The Lancet of May and June 1843. The lady who was the subject of the infliction I never knew anything of, she came to my establishment, as it were, determined not to be recognised, wrapped up in a shawl, veil, etc., and merely asked for a sulphur fumigating bath. She never said who she was, nor did she name any medical gentleman that had recommended her to take the fumigations. She merely told the female attendant that she had been under the treatment of the first medical authorities of the West End of London, and that they had done her no good. She was determined of her own accord to try the sulphur fumigations and did not say what was the nature of her malady. On the evening of the day that she took her first fumigating bath, the attendant, a more than usually clever experienced woman, came to me. She said that she had that day had a very curious and not pleasant case that the patient was all over worms, and that she saw them creeping from the patient's forehead and face while she was in the bath. I answered abruptly, telling her not to talk such nonsense. She, however, seemed to maintain that she was right. On the patient repeating the bath, the attendant came to me with the same tale, and was again reproved by me on which she said that she was correct in her statement, and added that she did not like to attend such a patient, as she herself might catch the disease. However, being a reasonable woman, her objection was overruled. The lady had her second bath, and the former report was repeated, with some enlargement. On taking the third bath, the attendant told the lady that she had named the case to me and that I had twice scolded her for talking such nonsense, on which the patient said, that was like all the doctors, they won't believe it. On coming out of the fourth fumigation, there was such a very, very numerous escape of worms that the attendant again became uneasy and I suppose some discussion took place between her and the patient. The result was that the latter sent me word that, as I would not believe it, I might come down and judge for myself. I did so, and never was more surprised. There stood the patient, on chemise. I was cautioned as I entered the room not to tread on the worms, and at once saw a round ring of pinkish white on the floor. These were worms that had fallen from under the chemise, and they had not been swept up in order that I might see them. The lady's head, face and chest were covered with the shawl and veil. She seemed afraid of being recognised. On removing part of the veil from the forehead, then reeking with perspiration, I saw little red points sticking out from the skin at right angles, and whilst looking at them, some seemed to retract themselves. Others evidently were getting longer, and became a quarter of an inch and more in length, and then fell on the chest and to the floor as others had done. 
I then held aside more of the veil from the face, ear and neck. There was the same appearance of little pink thread-like worms, as thick as they could cluster, elongating themselves to get out of the skin and then falling as from the forehead onto the floor. Many of them seemed to give a sort of jump or jerk before they could escape and fall from the person. The lady became more emboldened and I was allowed to remove the shawl from the neck and the chest, and afterwards from the arms and legs etc. But from all parts of the person these worms were sticking out, stretching themselves, and then with a positive jump escaping from their skin to the distance of 6 or 7 inches, occasioning me to stand at a distance in order that they might not fall or spring on myself. With the corner of a napkin I carefully wiped various parts of the skin where I saw the worms sticking out, but I could not wipe them away, though gently, without breaking off the heads, the bodies being very tender, whilst the gentle pressure of the napkin seemed to greatly facilitate and aid the escape of the others. And very many were full an inch in length, yet for the most part they were from a quarter to three quarters of an inch in length, and some more looking like pink thin threads. They were annular and transparent, with red heads, and the tail part was larger than the head part. They lived only a few minutes after escaping from the skin, wriggling themselves as worms do and almost invariably curling themselves into a crescent or horseshoe form. Then taking a spring to many inches distance, fell quite straight and dead and the redheads in that short time would become dark brown approaching black in colour. The napkin with which I had wiped the parts of the person I placed on a table, and having occasion to take it up again from the folds, the table under it was covered with these worms. I gathered about two or three tablespoonfuls of them, which were afterwards subjected to investigation as detailed in the Lancet of June 1843. It is satisfactory to know, at least as far as this case goes, that in the sulphur fumigating baths and perhaps other mineral fumigating baths, we have a positive and direct remedy for such ailments, and which I think may be thus easily explained. The moisture and heat of these baths softening and laxing the skin, the worms more easily get to the surface, whilst the sulphur, or perhaps other minerals that are used in the baths, would make their position there untenable, and they are readily enabled to escape from the skin. The lady whose case is just related was very desirous of getting well of her odious complaint, as she called it. It was a sad source of annoyance to her husband, as the worms were constantly escaping onto the pillows and sheets and had been doing so for more than two years. She attributed as the cause of the complaint her having fallen asleep in the air near some stagnant water, and on waking found her mouth and nose full, as she said, of young gnats. I suppose she got well for after a few more baths I never heard anything more of her, which I judge I should have done if she had not got well. For certain it is, she found a direct and powerful remedy in the use of the fumigations for dislodging these worms, not in hundreds, but I may safely say in thousands. The article goes on to describe various tropical parasites that can cause worms to inhabit a living body, I won't read the rest of it here because it's fairly dry and it's the plight of the unnamed woman that I wanted to focus on. As for what parasite it might be, your guess is as good as mine. I've looked into various worms that might infest a human body. There's the dreaded guinea worm or the botfly larvae. There's also threadworms, black fly, and there's quite a lot that I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce. Apparently some of them can even infect the human sinus cavity. None of them really match the description of the worms in the article, and most of these parasites aren't even found in the UK. In the one that I read it says that the unnamed woman fell asleep next to a stagnant pond and awoke to find her mouth and nose full of young gnats. 
this still doesn't make much sense because a gnat's eggs take three to four days to become larvae. Most likely she contracted the parasite days or weeks before and for some reason sleeping in the hot sun had brought them to the surface. This article piqued my interest because it's a bit of an anomaly. Exactly what the parasite was that infected this woman is still a mystery. Maybe somebody with more knowledge in parasitic worms and larvae could shed more light on it, but with my lack of expertise, the most I can do is provide some narration for a creepy story from medical history. It is possible that the story was made up. Maybe somebody was just trying to make a name for themselves and they invented an outlandish story and got it published in The Lancet. The details do remain consistent through the various articles he wrote on the subject, and they were published years apart. Not that that means it's true, but at least Dr. Green stuck to his story. I also think this story sticks out to me because of a strange memory I have from my childhood. I could probably make a whole video on weird memories from when I was a kid that don't make any sense now that I think about them as an adult. The memory I have is of being alone in my back garden, and I can't remember how old I was, I must have been very young. I see this thin white worm on the ground. I pick it up in my fingers and I drop it onto the palm of my hands to get a closer look, but as soon as it lands on my palm it gets really agitated and starts wriggling around. In a space of about a second it burrows into my hand and disappears underneath the skin. It didn't hurt at all, it just sort of tickled, and there was no visible mark left behind from where it went into my hand. It was just there one second wriggling around, and then it was gone, disappeared somewhere into the flesh of my palm. Now that I think back on it, it must just have been a really vivid dream. I've never had any symptoms of a parasitic worm, and I don't really know if they can burrow into your hand in a matter of a second. So I guess it didn't really happen, but the memory was so vivid and real that the image of that worm burrowing into my flesh has seared itself into my mind and even over 30 years later, I still remember it clear as day. Anyway, I hope you found the story interesting. On my last video I did joke about copy pasting an article for content and I've done basically that for this video, but I really like the language they use in these old medical journals and I kind of wanted to keep it intact. I'll probably look for some more of these creepy medical oddity stories to narrate in the future. Let me know what you think in the comments and shout out to everyone who is supporting the channel, it means a lot. Thank you to all of you. Unfortunately, a couple of my recent videos have been age restricted. If you're having trouble accessing any of them, I now have all my videos backed up on Odyssey. You can watch them there, ad free and without any restrictions. Alright, anyway, thank you for watching. If you're new here and you like the video, then subscribe to the channel. And until next time, goodbye.